I thank you so much for tuning back in. This is part C of this week's reading of Max Lucado, the book, the, the Story. One continuous novel about the Bible. If you've never read the Bible, don't know anything about it, or maybe you have little snippets of it, and maybe you're interested in reading the whole Bible, that is what we're doing. Uh, but you've turned into you've tuned into part C, um, chapter um, fourteen, a kingdom torn in two. So if you would like to catch up, please go to our our YouTube channel, ITR Polygraph. Hit playlist and look for the playlist for the story. Hit that, and then you can go through that and catch right up. And um, and I'd love to I'd love for you to do that. So. Uh, if you are just tuning back in though, we are on the top of, uh, actually we're in the middle of page 197, uh, reading through chapter 14, A Kingdom Torn in Two, and it is an adventure already. I, sentence after sentence, I can't believe what I'm reading, but it is true. That's the part. It's a novel written about the Bible, and the Bible, scripture says, is God breathed. It's a true story. So let's read about our history, of our world, of our of the people, of everything. That's what we're reading here today. So if you have your book, we are in the middle of page 197. Let's continue reading. Okay. At this at that time, Abijah, son of Jeroboam, became ill, and Jeroboam said to his wife, Go, disguise yourself, so you won't be recognized as the wife of Jeroboam. Then go to Shilhah. Ah Ahijah, the prophet, is there, the one who told me I would be king over this people. Take ten loaves of bread with you, some cakes and a jar of honey and go to him. He will tell you what will happen to the boy. So Jeroboam's wife did what he said and went to Ahijah's house in Shiloh. Now Ahijah could not see. His sight was gone because of his age. But the Lord had told Ahijah, Jeroboam's wife is coming to you. Ask about her son, for he is ill, and you are to give her such and you are to give her such and such an answer. When she arrives, she will pretend to be someone else. So when Aja heard the sound of her footsteps at the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why this pretense? I have been sent to you with bad news. Go tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I raised you up from among the people and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have aroused my anger and turned your back on me. Because of this, I am going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. Dogs will eat those belongings to Jeroboam who die in the city. The birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. As for you, go back home. When you set foot in your city, the boy will die. All Israel will mourn for him and bury him. He is the one belonging to Jeroboam, 
who will be buried because he is the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. The Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the family of Jeroboam. Even now, this is beginning to happen. And the Lord will strike Israel so that it will be like a reed swaying in the water. He will uproot Israel from the good land that he gave their ancestors and scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because they aroused the Lord's anger by making Asherah poles. And he will give up or he, and he will give Israel up because the sins of Jeroboam has committed and has caused Israel to commit. The, then Jeroboam's wife got up and left and went to Tirzah. As soon as she stepped over the threshold of the house, the boy died. They buried him and all Israel mourned for him as the Lord said, through his servant, the prophet, the prophet, Aijah. Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king of Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 73 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and Asherah holes on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. In the fifth year, the king Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards bore the shields, and afterward they returned them to the guard room. There was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and Rehoboam rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. His mother's name was Nama. She was an Ammonite, an Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. In the 18th year of the reign of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, Abijah became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem three years. His mother's name was Mekah, daughter of Abishalom. He committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, and the heart of David his forefather had been. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by raising up a son to succeed him and by making Jerusalem strong. For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. There was war between Abijah and Jeroboam throughout Abijah's lifetime. And Abijah rested 
with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David and Asa, his son, succeeded him as king. I like the way that this, the scriptures speak about death, very different than how we know death today. That it just says Abijah rested with his ancestors and was buried. It talks about resting. It talks about those asleep in the Lord. That they will one day be resurrected with the Lord. It's such a big difference than how we know or how we've been talked to about death here. Maybe it's because if we're not told about Jesus and heaven and everything, it's a different way to look at death. And it is not like everybody is running from death and is terrified and afraid. They hear it. They understand what's happening. There's a time for mourning. And then they move on. It's very, it's, it's incredible to me. They rested with his ancestors. It's a nice way to think about it. It's the way the scriptures call it. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem 41 years. His grandmother's name was Mecha, son or daughter of Abba Shalom. At the top of page 200, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and his father and his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of the idols his ancestors made. He even deposed his grandmother, Mecca, for her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image of the worship for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asra's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and the articles and that he and his father had dedicated. There was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, throughout their reigns. Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asha, king of Judah. Asa then took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasures of the Lord's temple and of his own palace. He entrusted it to his officials and sent them to Ben-Hadad, son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, the king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, and there was between, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you a gift of gold and silver. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. Ben-Hadad agreed with King Asa and sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel. He conquered Aijon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Abel, Beth, Maka, and all Kinnereth, in addition to Naphtali. When Basha heard this, he stopped building Rama and withdrew to Ter Terza. Then King Asa issued an order to all Judah. No one was exempt. And they carried away from Rama the stones and timber Basha had been using there. With them, King Asa built up Geba in Benjamin and also Mizpah. As for all the other events of Asa's reign, all his achievements, 
all he did and the cities he built are not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah. In his old age, however, his feet became diseased. Just a minute, I'm not sure. I'm just going to reread that. As for all other events of Azza's reign, all his achievements, all he did and the cities he built are not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah. In his old age, however, his, became, his feet became diseased. Then Asa rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of his father David. And Je Jehoshaphat, his son, succeeded him as king. And, and what, what I, why I reread that was because we're kind of talking about some things, some things and then it's not written and then his old age and then he became, his feet became diseased and then he rested with his ancestors. There's not much reading going on there, so it kind of goes from this to this to this. So I wondered if I had missed something there, but that is how it just went. It just kind of skipped over a whole lot of stuff and, and then ended with that. And um, obviously um, he, became, he, he became diseased and, um, and passed away. He rested with his ancestors. Okay, so we are almost finished this chapter. Let's keep reading. We are on the top of page 201. It says here, After 22 years as king of Israel, Jeroboam also died. Various kings reigned in Israel and Judah. Most of them did evil. Only a few kings were considered good. Like King Asa of Judah, who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, doing right including ridding the kingdom of idolatry. King Asa went so far as to remove his grandmother, Maka, from her lofty position of queen because queen mother because of her pagan worship. Asa didn't stop there. He understood that only the Lord God was worthy of worship and he cleaned the entire land of Judah of its idols. On the despicable side, Jeroboam's son, Nadab, did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following in the ways of his father. A man named Basha plotted against Nadab and killed the king and Jeroboam's whole family, fulfilling God's prophecy through the prophet Aisha. But Basha, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit, was no better a king. Likewise, Zimri, who also followed the evil ways of Jeroboam, killed his predecessor king, Elah, to get onto the throne. But Zimri had failed to calculate his popular support or lack thereof, and was in power all of seven days before burning himself to death in the palace and leaving the ashes of his discontent to Omri, the people's choice. During his reign, Omri made the city of Samaria the capital of the northern kingdom and Samaria also came to signify the entire territory of the northern tribes. When Omri died, his son Ahab became king of Israel, but the real power in the family was Ahab's infamous wife, Jezebel. Okay, a powerful woman of iron will and the daughter of a pagan foreign king. Ahab and Jezebel worshipped Baal and hated the prophets of God, of whom Elijah was chief. Elijah became public enemy number one, but God had a fiery confrontation planned to show the people whose side God himself was on. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he resigned 
He resigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah hole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abraham, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. That completes chapter 14. Wow. Um, did more to commit sin than the previous kings. I think about that in many of the pages that when we, I've heard of a saying, there's nothing new under the sun. That, you know, sin is sin and whatever, but you know, the sins of one king was one thing, and then it just got bigger, and then it got bigger, and it got bigger. And I wonder where God is with us and our world today. Are we more sinful than ever before, rather than better? In the eyes of the world, the, way, the ways of the world, the world may think this is, this is going great. I wonder in the eyes of the Lord what God is thinking about the sins of the people and the sins of our kings and queens and governments and rulers and, and everybody and, and the people who are in the land. It's still the God of today. So I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking a lot about that. So let's read what the questions would be for, que for chapter number 14, a, king a kingdom torn in two. These are the questions for next week. So please think about these. I'd love to hear from you. Um, number one, what caused the kingdom of Israel to be divided? Excellent. And if you need to reread the, the chapter or re-listen to the chapter in order to answer these questions, I suggest you do. I certainly do. I, I do take time to uh, reread everything or re-listen to the videos, actually. Uh, so question number two, how did Rehoboam and Jeroboam both make mistakes? Number three, what observations do you make about God's character and what is important to God based on this chapter? It's exactly what I was just, ask, just saying. In the eyes of God, he sees that sin and it looks worse than the king before. Do the people who are doing it think that they're sinning so badly? Do they care? How do they see that? That's a great question and it really is on my heart today uh, that um, what observations do you make about God's character and what is important to God based on this character? Question number four, why is it important to always remain loyal to God? Number five, when you have strayed from God, what caused the straying? Great question. Number six, in what ways has God been kind to you even when you didn't deserve it. You know, it was something that I thought about this week that, that God is 
I, I really felt God tested me and that he chose me to speak to me. And it's like, I, I question, do I deserve it? But, you know, he chose to speak to me or he cho chooses to speak to you. That it's, it's about that. Um, even when we didn't deserve it, right? So we kind of think, why, are, why is he talking now? Or why is it going on now? When we think about the different things that we've done. But maybe we've asked forgiveness. Maybe we're forgiven about that. But it's the enemy of our soul that brings up what we've done, what we do, we've done to make us think we don't deserve it. But anyway, I don't want to answer the questions ahead of time, but that's just kind of how I'm processing right now. Reading it, it really is incredibly emotional. I thank you for tuning in. I thank you for letting, um, letting me be able to read this and, uh, and process this as we go through. I look forward to your comments and, and, uh, and questions and, and everything. And uh, I'm going to write down all the different uh, countries um, that participate, but it, it is all around the world. And um, I, uh, I'll have that information uh, printed in the description uh, so that you can have that. So I thank you so much. I will see you next week. Have a great week. Stay healthy, well, uh -huh. and let's try and focus on God. And pardon Ruby, she's a bit uh, snoring on the, on the floor. Have a great week. Bye now.